Hi everyone, my name is Adam Dede, a postdoc in Beth Buffalo's lab, and welcome to my Neuro Journal Club. So this week I'm going to be telling you about the rhesus monkey hippocampus critically contributes to scene memory retrieval, but not new learning. Uh, published last year in the Journal of Neuroscience by Frodist Walsh, Browning, Proxen, Murphy, Shammy, Vethi, Wilson, and Baxter. Um, so this is going to be a really interesting one, actually. Um, hopefully I'll be able to bring some context to it a little bit more than I've been able to in some of the past discussions, because this is really pretty right in the wheelhouse of the types of things that I did in my PhD work. Um, so without any more preamble, let's jump in. Um, so the question that they're trying to address here is what aspects of cognition does the hippocampus contribute to? So memory for sure, but what aspect of memory is kind of hard to tease out? Um, any kind of measure of activity in the hippocampus, so you might be thinking about fMRI studies that you see in uh, popular media a lot, um, or maybe electrophysiological findings. Any type of activity measure of this sort is necessarily going to be a correlational measure. But manipulations of the brain can give actual causal insight. Um, also, it's important to really think about careful design of behavioral tasks. So. Um, here, the main um, manipulation of the brain is going to be lesion, so surgically uh, damaging a part of the brain in order to see how cognition changes as a result of that damage. Um, and then the behavioral tasks that we're going to be looking at are going to be these um, discrimination problems. And the key difference between uh, different experimental conditions will be whether the subject is learning these discrimination problems, a whole bunch of them at the same time or all at once or are they working on only one problem at a time until they learn it and then moving on to another one. Um, so in the Frodus Walsh uh, paper, they used um, stimuli that looked like this. So on any particular trial, the monkey would be presented with a screen that is just kind of an abstract set of colors and shapes. But embedded within it, there'd be one really big character, uh, which was essentially meaningless, just another part of the context. And then there would be two small characters. And one of these small characters would be arbitrarily decided to be the correct one, and one of them would be arbitrarily decided to be the incorrect one. So in this example, um, the seven might be the correct item, and the two might be the incorrect item. And the monkey would just choose one of the small characters by pressing it on a touch screen. And over the course of multiple exposures to any particular discrimination problem, you can imagine that the monkey would get better and better at correctly identifying the seven and um, correctly rejecting the two. And then here are just some other examples of similar scene discrimination problems. Um, the core idea here though is just that there's two items and the monkey has to learn which of those items is right and which of those items is wrong. So the fact that this is being done with these kind of abstract shapes and colors and the fact that it's being done on a touch screen, probably not so important as just the idea that there are two things, one's right, one's wrong, and the monkey has to learn it by trial and error. Um, so here they had 17 monkeys. They, the monkeys learned 100 discrimination problems at a time. So you can imagine sitting in front of a touch screen, you press an option, um, you either get it right or wrong, um, get a food reward if you get it right, don't get a food reward if you get it wrong. Um, and then there's 100 different images that, that can come up um, in any particular session. Um, so you're cycling between a whole bunch of different images here, or the monkey is cycling between a whole bunch of different images. Um, in each daily test session, all 100 problems were presented once each in random order. Um, the monkeys kept working on a set of 100 problems until they reached a 90% criterion on two consecutive days. Uh, after learning three sets like this, so um, all 300 problems were then repeated once in a final retention test. Um, and then four monkeys underwent surgical lesion of the hippocampus. Um, and one thing, uh, so one thing to think about, just imagining how this study would go, the monkey would learn um, the, this first set of 100 all the way up to criterion, then they'd stop working with that set, they'd get a whole another set of 100, um, learn that up to criterion, then they'd stop working with that set, and then they'd get a whole third and final set, learn that up to criterion, and then stop working with that set, one final test through the full, full set of 300, um, and then four out of the 17 would undergo surgical lesion. Um, and here's uh, some post-mortem pictures of these uh, four monkeys, um, hippocampi. Oops, didn't mean to do a highlight there. Um, and what you can see 
is that these are really very minimal lesions. So in some instances, like um, here in monkey three, um, you can see uh, there's an area where the hippocampus is really missing pretty much completely um, on both sides. Uh, but the surrounding uh, brain tissue is largely intact. Um, but at the same level of um, anterior posterior extent, you can see, for example, in monkey two, that the hippocampus is actually largely spared. It is damaged, and you can tell that because this area of ventricle is fairly large, where in a normal unlesioned animal, it would be uh, much smaller. Um, so there is damage going on here, but it's not on the same order as in monkey three. And importantly, if we look across all of these slides, um, you can't really see anywhere where there's much in the way of any damage going on outside the hippocampus. Um, perhaps in monkey three on uh, this top pair of images, there's a little bit of damage on the ventral surface of the brain. But given the fact that these lesions were made by excitatory injection from above, I'm actually thinking that's more likely to be um, some sloppy slide mounting uh, than it is actual lesion. Um, so big take home here is these lesions are, are pretty small and really pretty limited to the hippocampus proper. So let's see what the effects of the, these lesions were. Um, so what they found was that in the group of monkeys uh, that were given the lesions, we can compare their pre-op performance on that final retention test uh, here shown in the triangles to their post-op performance um, after they were given a couple weeks to recover from the surgery. And what you can see is that it doesn't matter if we're looking at set one, two, or three, they're impaired at remembering all three of them. Importantly on the y-axis here, we're looking at percent error. So uh, higher numbers e equal worse performance. Um, by contrast, if we look at the control monkeys, so these are the other 13 monkeys in the group that did exactly the same behavioral testing. They waited for exactly the same amount of time between that final retention test and the post-op test, but they just didn't have an operation in the middle. So although it says post-op, um, these monkeys actually didn't have an operation. Um, and what you can see is just as a, as a, as a, as a result of the passage of time, we don't really see too much in the way of forgetting. Basically, these monkeys have learned these sets well enough that taking an extra couple of weeks to just hang out and not see them um, is not enough to make them just totally forget. So the, the deficit that we're seeing here is, as a result of the hippocampal lesion um, likely is due to the lesion rather than some kind of just forgetting across time. Um, we can see though, um, that just overall there is some effect of forgetting across time because set one um, for which training was completed about 113 days ago on average um, is a little bit harder for both the hippocampal lesion and the control monkeys and you can see that in that set one is uh, higher up on this percent error um, than sets two and three so there is some overall effect of forgetting over time um, but that seems to be totally independent from this effect of hippocampal lesion um, which seems to be affecting all three sets um, pretty equivalent, equivalently by about 10% error. So they're not totally forgetting, but they're definitely getting significantly worse after hippocampal lesion. So what about new learning? Um, so in this study, uh, Frodus Walsh uh, and colleagues also went ahead and tested these monkeys on learning a brand new fourth set um, after the operation for the hippocampal lesion monkeys and for the control monkeys this would have just been some other set you know um, and what you can see is that by uh, they've plotted the same data two different ways so over here in uh, panel C on the left you can see the number of errors to criterion so how many total errors did the monkey make in getting up to that 90 percent over two consecutive days criterion and you can see that both uh, groups of animals are making just shy of 400 errors in order to reach that criterion and there's no difference for the hippocampal lesion animals and then if we look at it in more detail um, by looking at it session by session and look at how that percent error drops as the monkeys learn um, these uh, these items better and better what you can see is that there's really no difference at all between the hippocampal lesion animals and the control animals so um, what can we conclude? So it seems like, based on these results, the hippocampus is important for long-term retrieval. Doesn't matter how long ago, um, at least you know, on the order of 16 weeks, 113 days ago, uh, the hippocampus is still important for retrieval. 
Um, but the hippocampus is not important for new learning. So anyone who, who knows a bit about this, this literature is going to feel like these are two really weird things to say because they're really kind of exactly the opposite of what a lot of the hippocampal literature has found. Um, so, so let's dig into why this might be. Um, and so first, let's take a look at some, some of the contradictory results. So um, here's a paper from 1990 um, by Zola Morgan and Squire. And the title of it really says what, what you're looking at. The primate hippocampal formation, evidence for a time-limited role in memory storage. And here, what they're doing is a very, very similar situation. The monkeys on each trial are faced with two now physical objects rather than objects on a, a you know abstract objects on a touch screen but two objects nonetheless and their goal is to discriminate which of those objects is correct and which of those objects is incorrect on each trial and here what they did was they taught the monkeys several sets of these discrimination problems um, and they did so at 16 weeks 12 weeks 8 weeks 4 weeks and 2 weeks prior to surgical lesion of the hippocampus now here, they've plotted percent correct rather than percent error. So um, that would imply then that, that higher numbers mean better performance. And what you can see is that the hippocampal lesion animals have a really large deficit relative to the normal animals for the items that were learned two or four weeks prior to surgery. But then once we get to eight, 12, and 16 weeks prior to surgery, we see that there really is no longer a deficit as a result of the hippocampal damage. Importantly, the animals are all still above chance, but, um, but there's really no, no effect of the lesion. Um, so this is, this is really more of the kind of the classic finding that you see with um, what can be referred to as a temporally graded retrograde amnesia. Um, there's a gradient in how bad that amnesia is across time, hence temporally graded. And then retrograde, it's retroactive to information before the lesion. So what's different? Um, so this is just a quote straight from the Zola Morgan and Squire 1990 paper. So monkeys were trained on five different sets of 20 two-choice object discrimination problems. Um, so 100 total discrimination problems. So a lot fewer than, um, than we saw in the, uh, the Baxter paper. Um, or sorry, Baxter's the last, so Frutus Walsh, the Frutus Walsh paper. Um, and training on each 20 pair set began at these different times before surgery. But here, I think, is really the important part. For training, each object pair was presented for 14 consecutive trials with a 15-second intertrial interval. Monkeys were trained on two new object pairs each day. So in this situation, the monkey is only learning two object discrimination problems per day, and each one that they learn, they learn it with this big mass of 14 consecutive trials. So this is a really different way of training it um, than Frutus Walsh. So um, Zola Morgan and Squire are using this one at a time style of training. So the monkey only works on one discrimination problem at a time. Whereas Frutus Walsh used an all at once style of training um, where the monkey's working on a hundred different problems all at the same time. So does that really matter though? Um, so this, in this study by Murray and Gaffin in 2006, they compared these two situations. Um, or rather, they didn't compare these two situations, but they, they asked this question of whether or not the masked training versus the one at a time training would make a big difference. So they were inspired by what's shown here on the right panel, this finding from Harlow from way back in 1949, where he showed that as monkeys learn these discrimination problems, again, it's just two objects, one of them's right, one of them's wrong, and the monkey has to learn which one's right by trial and error. Um, as they learn more and more of these discrimination problems, what you can see is that on the first 16 problems that the monkey learns, you can see this kind of slow buildup of performance, where on the first trial they're at 50% because they've never seen this problem before. Um, but then, you know, they slowly build up getting higher and higher percentages correct. Um, but then when we look at the well-trained monkey who's done 133 to 232 of these discrimination problems, there's something really quite different going on where from that first trial to the second trial, we see this dramatic jump in uh, percent correct. The monkey has learned how to learn these problems um, in a way that is really fundamentally different. Rather than slowly building up performance, they're making this just step jump in their performance. Um, but then Murray and Gaffin, they wondered, does it really matter 
that the monkeys learned one problem at a time, would it be possible for the monkeys to learn how to learn quickly for many problems at once? So what they did here was the, they had the monkey working on 20 problems at a time where each one of those 20 problems was shown once per day. So the monkey would do 20 trials per day and they'd only have 20 and they'd have 20 different problems each day. And they would do that um, in the exact same number of trials per problem that Harlow did, um, that I think Harlow did only six trials per problem. Um, so they did the same number of trials per problem, um, except they're doing this, this massing them together. And so what you can see is that Murray and Gaffin really found something, hey Ziza, really found something quite different from what Harlow found in that the monkeys even when they've done a very large number of these problems are not improving in how quickly they pick up any individual problem. They're still doing this slow buildup of information. And if we look back at the results that um, Frodus Walsh found, it looks a lot like what Murray and Gaffin found in this slow buildup of information. The monkey's performance is just slowly and continuously getting better. There's not really any step change in their performance. And if we think about the numbers here, by the time the, the monkeys in the Frutish Wall study are encountering this fourth set, um, they had already done 100 training problems, 300 problems for the pre-lesion set, and now they're doing an additional 100 problems. So they've got an extensive amount of experience with this task, and they're still showing this slow buildup of information. So, oops. So... Taken together, the results from this Murray and Gaffin paper and the Frutish Walsh paper, it suggests that monkeys, when they are learning these concurrent problems, where many problem, many discrimination problems are presented at the same time, they're not capable of achieving what Harlow found in 1949, this one-shot, really quick learning of any individual problem. So how does this relate to humans? Um, so normal humans, um, shown here on this left plot, um, we're given 16 pair, uh, pair discrimination problems, um, very similar task to what the monkeys do. Um, and they were given 40 trials in each session. So that would imply 2.5 trials with each problem. And what you can see is that as they go from session one to session two, um, they're very, very quickly getting up to 90% correct. Um, you know, about 80 trials and they're already at 90% correct. So this is way faster um, than the monkeys. And we can compare directly um, to some data collected by Alvarez, Zola, Morgan, and Squire. Um, so over on the left, this is data from Bailey, Fresino, and Squire, uh, 2005. And on the right, we're looking at data from Alvarez, Zola, Morgan, and Squire, 1995. Um, and what you can see is that normal animals, if we just ignore the hippocampal and the H plus animals for a second, the normal animals are taking on the order of about 400, um, 400 to 600 trials in some cases to, uh, to learn um, a task that's actually a little easier than what the humans were doing. The monkeys in this case are doing only eight concurrent discrimination problems as opposed to 16. Um, so we can see here that the, the monkeys really learn this dramatically more slowly. And although they're not showing it here, um, you can imagine that what this might look like is going to be very similar um, to what Murray and Gaffin found of just a slow buildup of performance rather than any kind of quick insight type learning. So. What about when humans have hippocampal lesions? So in, uh, in this same study from Bailey, Fresino, and Squire, um, they actually had two patients um, that had large medial temporal lobe damage. So this is similar to what is often referred to as an H plus lesion um, in, the, in the monkey literature. Um, and, uh, and just to note, these, uh, these humans came by their damage um, by accidents of life. Uh, both of them had viral encephalitis. So uh, no one's going around surgically lesioning humans um, just to lay that aside. And so both of these um, human participants have graciously, vo graciously volunteered um, to participate in studies of this kind. Um, and basically what they did here, um, they came in for a very large number of sessions. Um, I think actually Jen uh, Fersino actually drove out to the houses of these two patients a um, couple times a week for, for a number of weeks um, in order to collect these data. And what you can see is that in each 40 trial session with these 16 pairs, the two humans with large medial temporal lobe lesions 
slowly improve over time and they don't really show any kind of quick insight type learning. So this is a very similar kind of learning to what's going on with the monkeys when they're faced with a concurrent discrimination problem. And now turning back to the results from the monkeys um, from Alvarez, Zola, Morgan and Squire in 1995, what you can see here is that animals that have hippocampal lesions are unaffected on this concurrent discrimination task. So it suggests that the normal animals are not using their hippocampus to do this task. Um, and that makes sense. If we consider that the, the, the type of learning that you might expect to see from the, when the hippocampus is involved is this quick um, and, and kind of explicit type of learning where you go from not knowing to knowing in a single step, um, that's really not what you, what you see when you're looking at 400 to 600 trials to learn something. Um, and now in the humans, again, that's not what we're seeing here either. And of course, they don't have uh, hippocampi, so of course it's not hippocampal learning here. Um, and the number of trials that they're taking is actually really in line with these H plus animals. So now these animals are animals that have lesions not just to the hippocampus, but also to the perirhinal and parahippocampal cortices, uh, the cortices that lie just adjacent to the hippocampus. So just one aside on this anatomy, um, it's important to note that in many cases, these H plus lesions, these large lesions, um, may have accidentally included area TE. So the perirhinal cortex is an important memory structure in the anterior medial temporal lobe. And then TE is an important high level perception structure just next to perirhinal cortex. So the dramatic difference between hippocampus only lesions and larger H plus, H plus lesions may be due to accidental TE damage. Um, so in this paper from Buffalo, Ramos, and Zola um, in 1999, um, they actually looked really carefully um, at data that had been collected in previous studies and they re-examined some of the post-mortem brains of these monkeys to ask, are these monkeys really uh, monkeys with damage limited to perirhinal or is there damage that invades out into area TE? Um, and what they found was that the, on, uh, on this concurrent discrimination task, um, animals with damage that was limited to perirhinal, um, there was some suggestive evidence, now it's a small number of animals, but there's some suggestive evidence that these animals may not really be impaired on, um, on this task uh, of concurrent discrimination. Um, whereas the animals with damage to TE look like they are impaired. Um, so what may be going on then is that when we see uh, this difference between H and H+, plus, um, it really is that you don't need your hippocampus at all to do this kind of slow buildup of information style of learning. Um, but when you have a lesion that extends out into area TE perhaps, uh, it may actually make it difficult even to perceive the items properly. Um, and of course, with the human patients, with these being lesions that are accidents of nature, um, the, the lesion margins are, are never going to be perfect, um, especially since they're due to uh, viral infection. Um, and then here you can see a picture of the, the bottom surface of a monkey brain, um, and you can see area, the perirhinal area and area TE um, highlighted. Um, and, and you can probably appreciate how difficult it would be um, for there to be a lesion that really damages the perirhinal cortex and leaves area TE completely intact. Um, so that aside, um, so monkeys can all at once learn without a hippocampus, but what about the one at a time learning? If that's the big difference, um, they can do this all at once. They do it slowly. They don't do it like a human with, with quick uh, explicit style learning, um, but their hippocampus is not involved in this slow uh, slow buildup of information style of learning. Um, but what about this one at a time learning, since that seems to be the difference um, between the, um, uh, the Furtish Walsh paper and the Zola Morgan paper that we started with. Um, so it turns out that learning one discrimination at a time is not impaired by hippocampal damage in monkeys either. So um, again, we see that monkeys are taking a crazy high number of trials to criterion um, and that crazy high number of trials to criterion is similar whether the monkey's normal, hippocampally damaged, or H plus damaged in this uh, Alvarez, Ola, Morgan, and Squire 1995 paper. So, but what about, what, what about Harlow? What about the, these findings where 
it seems like there's really something very different going on between the one at a time style discrimination problem learning that Harlow looked at back in 1949 versus the mass concurrent discrimination problem that Murray and Gaffin looked at in 2006. Well, it's important to keep in mind that Harlow's monkeys only showed this quick, explicit seeming, uh, you know, insight type of learning um, when they were really well trained. This was not something that the naive animals were able to do. So you might even imagine that initially when the animals are, are doing this kind of slow buildup of information in, in the first 16 or maybe first 32 um, problems that they face, uh, they are not using their hippocampus to do this. And this slow buildup of information is the, type of, is the type of learning that we know is not dependent on the hippocampus. In all of the data that we're looking at here, consistently, you don't need a hippocampus to do this slow buildup of information, both in humans and in monkeys. So, um, so it might be that what Harlow has done here is he's really trained his monkeys to use their hippocampus, and he's trained them to learn the task the way a human would by making a quick single trial inference saying, oh, if I choose object A and object A is wrong, then object B must be correct. And there's no need for any further trial and error learning because you've just done it in one shot. Um, but we see a real key difference here between monkeys and humans in that even with extensive training, the monkeys cannot learn how to do um, multiple quick insight problems all at the same time. They really only have the capacity to bring in one at a time. Now, of course, you know, drawing a hard line on the capacity is going to be a really difficult thing. And of course, these two studies can't tell us at the end of the day exactly where that hard line lies. But certainly there is some kind of capacity to how much information can quickly be brought in uh, via the hippocampus for this kind of quick, uh, you know, all at once kind of, or quick um, in, quick insight, explicit learning um, has some kind of limit. Um, and then there does not seem to be such a limit on the slow buildup of information style learning since the Frutus Walsh paper showed that monkeys can learn a hundred different items at the same time. And in fact, the numbers of, number of errors that the monkeys get on their way to Criterion is not horribly dissimilar from the um, number of trials it takes for a monkey to learn only eight pairs. So conclusions. Monkeys tend to learn discrimination problems through slow buildup of trial and error learning, and the hippocampus is not needed for this. Humans tend to learn discrimination problems in one-shot explicit learning, and the hippocampus is needed for this. Monkeys can be trained up to where one-at-a-time discrimination problems are learned in one shot, like humans. What's not known, though, is what would happen if you took a monkey that was trained to where they could do one-at-a-time discrimination problems in one shot, and then you lesion their hippocampus. Now, if we're saying that this kind of one-shot learning is something that's mediated by the hippocampus, then that experiment should show that you can get your monkey all the way to where they're doing really good one-shot one, you know, one learning on these single discrimination problems, and then after a hippocampal lesion, their performance should go all the way back to the slow buildup of information as if they had not been trained. But that experiment has not been done. Monkeys are not capable of training to learn one-shot learning when many discrimination problems are mixed together. So there's some kind of capacity limitation on how much information can be brought in in this quick explicit style of learning via the hippocampus. Even though monkeys don't use their hippocampus to learn, lesioning it has an effect on retrograde memory for all items when they're learned all at once. And this is really the surprising finding um, from the Frutus Walsh paper um, from last year. No one would have thought, or at least I wouldn't have thought, that, um, that a task in which you can learn it without a hippocampus would have its information storage dependent upon the hippocampus in any way. Now importantly, these monkeys didn't totally forget um, the, uh, the information that they had learned pre-surgery, um, but the effect was pretty significant. So that's, that's a really strange thing. And not only was there this significant effect on retrograde memory, but it did not have a temporal gradient, which is weird considering this last point that lesions to the hippocampus only affect recent memories when the memories were learned one at a time. 
So it seems like the hippocampus not only plays different roles in the encoding of information, depending upon if this information is learned in one shot or all at once, it also plays a different role in storing the information depending on if the information is learned in one shot or all at once. And these different roles may be somewhat independent since we see different effects of the hippocampal lesion um, on retrograde and anterograde amnesia. Um, anyway, uh, thanks for watching. If you like these videos, please subscribe and uh, comment if you have any questions. Thanks. Bye.